All right, welcome everyone to the April 28th Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Um, as you're all aware, two things we must abide by. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. Uh, so the first announcement that we have today is the standard one that we have. Hyperledger Dev Weekly developer newsletter goes out each Friday. If you have something that you would like to include in that, please uh, add a comment to the wiki page that's linked in the agenda. Uh, the second one is the Hyperledger Global Forum happening in September. Um, the CFP closes tomorrow. So if you haven't yet got your uh, CFP submit it, please do so now. And uh, if you hadn't noticed, there are also workshops that were added on the, um, I guess, Wednesday. So maybe now this is September 12th through the 14th. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you have a workshop that you'd like to present, please consider adding that as a CFP as well. Any other announcements that anybody has? Okay, uh, so if there's no other announcements, the uh, quarterly report fabric uh, came in last week. I see that I think there was nine of 14 folks who have reviewed that so far. I did not see any comments um, that came in. Uh, any, any comments at this point about fabric that we should talk about in the CSC meeting? Okay, so no. And then also uh, the Sawtooth report did come in already. Uh, it was due today. I think it came in yesterday or the day before. Um, there have been a few people who've had an opportunity to review that, uh, but if you haven't, um, please do so this week. And uh, that's all we have for the reports. So as far as discussion, um, Dano, you created a um, an issue slash and a PR for talking about what happens when um, projects don't have a maintainer policy, what the default policy should look like, as well as um, what we should do if there is inactivity in the um, in any of the repositories. So, did you want to um, walk us through kind of where we're at with this PR? Sure. Um, so I phrase this as a general inactivity policy, and it addresses two aspects of, in, of inactivity at first, um, when a maintainer goes inactive and when a repository goes inactive. Um, so the proposal for the maintainer inactivity policy is, um, there is, you know, the last line gives the out. If a project has its own policy, use their policy. Um, if they adopt a ridiculous policy, TSE will probably push back on it, but haven't seen any ridiculous policies yet. Um, so the default policy, if no one specifies one, and we probably need to figure out what this time frame is, is that if a maintainer hasn't contributed within three, four, six months, um, they'll be retired from active, active maintainer. Um, and most projects have this date called an emeritus maintainer, people who used to have commit privileges, but no longer have them, but they want to, you know, respect their contributing role in the past. So they list them as emeritus. Um, and when you become emeritus, you lose all your maintainer rights, privileges, responsibilities, accountability, and all that that goes along with it. So as part of that, we would uh, take you out of the real GitHub groups. Um, we would remove the ability to write code to the repository to have your reviews approve them. You can still participate. Um, but what's what's being removed is your write privileges. Um, and then we define, you know, basically that what we're going to track is what GitHub can attribute to activity. And they can track a lot. You do a comment on one issue and it marks it as, as active. So to do nothing for six months, I think, or three months or four months or six months, and I'm I'm personally leaning towards six months, but I'll let the TSC, um, we'll vote and figure it out and workshop it together. But if you haven't done anything as much as comment on an issue in six months, you're probably far separated from the project. So it's probably time for you to go. Um, so there are, um, some clauses for what happens if this sneaks up on you because you're doing another project. 
Um, you'll be asked with a, with a PR for a week, you'll get an at mention and it'll say, hey, we're moving you to Emeritus. And if you say, totally forgot about this, I'm gonna contribute, you get one three month extension to continue contributing and, and maintain your privileges. And this is there to, to be, be nice to people who get caught up in other life issues or other work issues. So they can still, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the more than gentle nudge that you need to contribute or, you know, we're gonna, you know, you're gonna need to uh, turn in your, your right privileges. Um, and also one final clause that just because you're married just doesn't mean you can become a maintainer again, but it would be through the same process. Um, so that's a quick overview of the maintainer policy. The repository and activity policy is the same but different. Um, and it's different for a couple of reasons. One, the time frame is 12 months. Uh, no releases in 12 months or no commits in six months. But a continual rolling extension is something that might be um, needed because there are projects out there who are basically, um, you know, their frameworks and they almost never change. And if they don't have any dependencies and there's no security risks, there's no requirement for it to need to be updated. So as long as they keep every 12 months or every six months saying, hey, we're still alive, you know, I see no reason to force the, the roll away of the repository. And how do we done is it would be marking it as archived under GitHub, which can be undone. Um, but the, the goal here is to put some sort of a, um, you know, a garbage collection on repositories that got forgotten about or moved on from, so they don't clutter up um, newcomers when they come in and say, well, let's look at all these basic repositories and I have no idea which repository works being done on, what's relevant and what isn't relevant. So we try and keep it fresh so that the repositories for project need to be vouched for or worked on every 12 or six months or whatever standard we, we, we propose there. So those are the two um, aspects of an activity and basically, you know, to keep, uh, you know, keep, keep, keep things tidy and put some objective standards to it. Any comments? So this is, I know I have a question more in regard to who makes the call when there is contention, for instance, I mean, especially the last part, right? The, the repository inactivity, um, it implies that somebody is going to make a judgment call, right? Right, so mm -hmm. what, we've, what I've seen so far is that you can run reports and you'd use the report from GitHub. And right now it's the Hyperledger staff that has best access to those commit logs to generate these reports. So it would either be a TSC responsibility or be a Hyperledger staff responsibility. We should probably clarify that in this policy. That's a good point. That's my point, exactly. Thanks. Arun? Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. Now I can okay. hear you. Hey, Ramana. So thanks for putting up this proposal. So I have potentially a few questions and uh, open areas that we still need to address with this proposal, right? For instance, I guess I pointed out that in the proposal in, in a case of, let's say some maintainer is maintaining multiple projects and not just one. So it is true for some of the projects that we have, for instance, I know Transact, Sawtooth and um, Grid, for instance, right? So the maintainer said the group is still the same. And I know they work on some of the projects when it is time for that project, otherwise, for that, for those repositories, it's mostly untouched for a while, unless somebody else comes in and adds some additional patches or it, it requires some maintenance activity to be done because of, let's say the dependency, the alerts that comes in. So otherwise, mostly the, there is no much contribution going on into those. I don't think so we can specifically put that in a time timeline in the sense we cannot say it is can be done in three months or six months. And that was my point um, as well, in, in a way. So putting a time boundary for such topics is difficult. So probably there should be another clause alongside the time boundary. I'm not denying that time boundary is a bad idea. Um, maybe we need additional, um, let's say, option alongside that so that we could better measure it, the, the intention over here. So that's so one. What standard would it be and would it apply to with uh, repositories or maintainers? It would be both. So the reason I'm saying, yeah, that was about, that was my second point about repositories. So let's talk about some of the projects that 
do not get much updates for a longer period, right? For instance, um, a project that is fairly stable or the SDK repositories, which unless we think of adding additional feature capabilities or one of the dependency that SDK depends on itself has not gone bad. I mean, there, there, is, there are very less um, instances where we would think of considering adding a new patch on top of it. Um, it could also go to, let's say, the consensus library implementations in some of the projects. So for these, the updates may not happen, sometimes may not happen within three months frame, or maybe we cannot time bound, we cannot put it in a time boundary. So that's so, one of my question if we can address. So one of the things written into the repository, there is no limit to extensions. Um, if every 12 months you say, no, really, it's fine, then it won't be archived. And I think that addresses the issue of the judgment calls. You know, what's a judgment call? And so what this policy says is every 12 months, someone needs to pass judgment on it from within the project saying, yes, this is good. Yes, this is being kept up to date. Or, you know what, it's time to clean it up. Um, versus the maintainer, which is kind of a forced um, outing because there are security risks, but there's also a security risk clause repository that if your security vulnerabilities are piling up, um, then it needs to be closed. So there's... There is judgment calls and the time frame. if we keep it like 12 months, we don't have to do it as often. And I see uh, Arun put his hand down. Um, Peter. So, I mean, if we can have an alternate to time, I think three, I like the time frame option yeah. of three months, but in addition to that, if we can have something else, which says okay. if there was no update done at all for the project, then we cannot expect you to contribute something. So time doesn't really count in such case, right? So maybe- okay, can, you write, can you write a proposal for what that might be and put it in the PR? I mean, sure, if we can discuss and I am happy to put it out as a- I mean, I, we need a specific counter proposal, just, you know, it should be something different. Doesn't move this forward. So a specific counter proposal would be best. Um, Peter. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say I like the timelines. I also agree that the longer ones should be picked. So for maintaining reactivity instead of three months, I would also go with six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a quick idea would be uh, specific on that renewal or extension for projects where there's just happens to be a legitimate need for them to be the way that would actually trigger the rules. So could we or should we add questions for this on the quarterly report so that it's a, sort of an automatic thing that we notice instead of instead of it going the way where we notice that they haven't contributed anything and then we try to archive the project and then they say, oh, it's it's all good because of this and this and this. So should we go ahead of that and should they be able to just say this somehow on the quarterly reports proactively. That could also apply to um, labs as well. And I don't know the labs of quarterly reports. Oh, OK. Yeah, that makes it trickier. OK, well, that's all I had. Other than that, I really like the proposal, every yeah. piece of it. So thank you for that. Cool. Nathan? Um, first, I, I'd say I agree with Peter on the longer time frames are, are typically better because, um, you know, it's easy for things to get. We, I think the administrative burden of trying to do things on a more continuous cycle can be caught quite high. Um, and I would also say that I like the idea of bundling the question of what repositories are active or not active in with other questions where we can. Um, the idea of once a year, somebody from the staff says, how's your project doing? how can we help you? And by the way, which of these repositories can be retired feels a lot better than kind of a random email showing up that says, you better do something or this is going to go away. Because uh, at least a lot of the projects I've worked on, it's easy for those emails to get lost in the shuffle, especially when there's a lot of other things going on at the same time. Um, and I also like the idea of maybe having the ability to have some sort of like standing orders in a repository. For example, if a component, if a system is broken out down into multiple GitHub repositories, um, looking at the activity in aggregate is sometimes better than looking at any one individual repo. 
because one of the repositories might just be glue that hooks everything else together and it might not need to be changed. And I think this idea of, you know, well, asking it 12 months covers that pretty well. I don't know that we need to do anything more than that, but I think it would be good to clear space for someone like Rye to be able to say, put a note in the, in the, in the maintainers file or put a note somewhere that says what the, the, what the decision of the maintainers is on this one. That way I don't have to bother asking more often. Um, something like that might make it so it's easier to do the work. Um, and then the last thing I, I was going to say is uh, from a PR and a um, talking about the project standpoint, I like calling emeritus maintainers maintainers. And I think for the most part with our projects, emeritus maintainers are folks we'd love to recruit back. We haven't had very many folks who you know we'd rather they never came back. I think for the most part, those emeritus maintainers, we like to, to say, if they were to show up and start contributing, we would put them back in really quickly. And I think that the text of this covers that quite well. Um, I think the only other note there is sometimes there's someone that's been doing a lot of work with a project who I would treat as an emeritus maintainer, even though they never went through the maintainership cycle. Sometimes it's because they were someone who did a lot of code contribution before it became a Hyperledger project, or sometimes it's someone who's done a lot of contribution to the project outside of its code. For instance, someone who's worked with the education and documentation group and done a lot of uh, advancement of the project without necessarily contributing to the, the source code repository directly. Is it okay if we just treat those folks as emeritus maintainers as well? My feeling is, is it is, but it's kind of a, a how does that each particular project want to deal with that? And quickly on that, each project should have its own standard on that. I mean, it opens up another can of worms. Do we need to standardize the uh, maintainer life cycle? Um, way too deep for today's discussion. And I think we would need to see if something's not working and needs to be standardized before we go down that path. But yeah, all good points. Um, Tracy. Yeah, so uh, I think it's important to note that this is a default policy if the projects haven't defined their own policies. So the policy, the, this policy could be overridden if a, if a project actually writes their own uh, policy. So some of the concerns that people have about this project is somewhat special and so therefore might want to have their maintainer hang out longer, um, you know, than otherwise I, I think could be taken care of by just overriding the default policy that is being proposed here. Um, I also, it, because of that, would suggest that three months is the appropriate time because otherwise you're looking at nine months that somebody could possibly do nothing and be considered a maintainer on a project um, instead of three months plus an additional three months for the total of six months. Um, so I will be the one who says that, you know, everybody else is going towards six months is the, the way that we should go for that. But I would suggest three months as the default policy. And if you don't like that, you can override the policy. Because I think in general, we would want people to write their own policies, not um, use the, the default one. Because I think each community and each project is gonna be different in the way that they want to handle things. Um, and I, I would say that uh, if people are not responding to the PR that their repository is going to go inactive, then they're probably not even looking at that repository of the PRs and issues in that um, repository. So um, I'm perfectly fine with saying like, why, why make this more difficult? Let's just make a, a PR and if people don't respond then uh, after, you know, I, I personally, I think we should put in if they don't respond after a week, then it gets, um, then it gets resolved. That PR gets merged. Um, so, those are the, the points that I think I have to make on this particular conversation. Uh, Hamlish. Yeah, hi. So I think uh, other than the timeline, uh, we should have another parameter like uh, how much the particular repository being used, number of download or maybe clone or fork because uh, because I, I can take an uh, example, like yesterday I was looking at one of the Hyperledger pro project and I see is archived. So maybe in terms of the user, it give kind of low confidence whether I should use this repository for my projects or 
because it's archived, is up to date or not. So, uh, create kind of maybe changing the status to archive, we, we can consider the other parameter also, like what Arun mentioning. Yeah. Um, one of the things about archive is it's an indicator that this project's not being maintained. So whatever state we would go to, we would want to make sure that it carries that same weight of you're using unmaintained code. So I don't know how best to communicate that in GitHub other than archiving it. So, okay. Um, Arno? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you just said. And in fact, my comment is, is somewhat related to this, which is, you know, and, I, I've heard several people, we all kind of seem to naturally want to give people more time rather than less, but there's a downside to doing this, which is what we communicate to the, to the, to the world, to the community out there. Um, it, what we shouldn't do is just because we're trying to be nice and give people plenty of time uh, is in fact, let projects be inactive and the community not being aware that this project is actually not really being maintained for the developed and so on. And uh, people will come, they will start using it, they will ask questions, maybe submit even PRs, and those things don't get even processed because there is actually nobody, nobody in there that's actually working on the project. And so I think we need to balance this, you know, with the, this idea that, well, it doesn't hurt, you know, we can let them be. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nathan. And to, to add to that, um, how do we communicate that in a really constructive way? Because, um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm a little worried that our repository policy might conflict or force our hand in an uncomfortable way on the project lifecycle policy. Meaning if we have something like an add-on tool to a blockchain that's really much less active and maybe rightly so, um, I, it, it would be really hard if the, if the maintainers and repository inactivity policy forces all the code into archive when we haven't finished the life cycle of the project or finished doing the retirement of the project itself. So uh, I, I think I, I like the idea of forcing the issue because it, it can kick some of the maybe users of, of a repository to, to take action and participate in pull requests and making sure that the security fixes are being done. Um, I just, it, it seems like there may be a gap there that we have to address if one of these projects actually goes into severe inactivity. And I agree, there's other metrics which you look at, like, you know, your, your, your dependencies are the dependencies up to date using up to date versions that don't have active CVEs against them. And I'm wondering if that might be a better indicator that it's time to archive a project than just the time frame. Because if you have no dependencies and there's one thing really well, like, say, calculate the chat hash, you know, that one can sit open forever without any modification because, you know, how often are security issues posted against a hashing algorithm? It happens, but it's really rare. Um, so my quick thought of this policy, um, I don't think it's ready for vote today. I'm going to split this into two separate PRs, um, cause I think the issues with maintainers and repositories are quite orthogonal and how we judge repositories. And I'm going to work on the maintainer one first and try and, uh, move this forward uh, again next week for some iteration. Um, one open question though, is that I think we need to get a better feedback on sooner or later is whether this should be a Hyperledger Foundation staff issue for the uh, maintainer and default policy, or is it a TSC default issue? Um, if the staff could give an opinion on what they think it should be. Hi, I'm staff. Um, hi, staff. Hi, right. Hi. hi. <laughs> I, uh, it, it may not always be you, but. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm uh, I, I think that the data can come from staff um, because I'm just for full transparency. I, I get this data from the audit log, um, so I don't want to, you know, give broad ability to read the audit log. Um, so I think it's fine. 
if the data comes from staff. If the data is then provided to TSC members or uh, specific TSC members to make these decisions, that's fine. But I think getting the data for the the near future is going to it's going to remain in staff activity. Okay. Cool. So I'll, I'll revise this for next week. Um, I think the two things to think about would be to one have a a formal vote on the duration, and then I'll update the stuff on the report. So I'll get this ready for next week, and then we'll iterate on repository. I'll post which PR I'm going to post that to um, after I get the staff stuff fixed, and if people could chime in with their ideas, because it's it's a much deeper well, I think, than the maintainer policies, mostly because we don't have a default repository and activity policy. Um, so I did say in chat, um, I was Not looking into, <laughs> well, I said it in the TSC channel on uh, Discord. Um, I, I looked into it and Kubernetes is much different. It's not as much different project, but it is much harder to become a maintainer, to get a commit bit in a Kubernetes project. Um, and it's much harder to lose your commit bit. Uh, I think if we transitioned over a longer timeline to something like Kubernetes policy about what it takes to get a commit bit, because right now they're free. Um, then we could look into something like their much longer 18 month uh, timeline. So that's just food for thought. I, I agree. The standards for onboarding should be um, about as extensive as the standards for offboarding to the commit bit. So that it should be reflective and equal, equal things. If it takes a lot to get it, it should take a lot to take it away. But Kubernetes is a very special beast for sure. 18 months is a long time, but it's probably going to take you two years to get that commit bit. Okay. Um, I think that closes this discussion. So I'm not going to ask for a vote for on this today. It's not ready. All right. Thanks, Dano. Um, any other TC business before we move on to the task force discussion? Maybe just to, to point out that David did put uh, an email out to the TSC list, if you haven't read it yet, um, about some additional policies that he'd like to have us review and, and weigh in on. Um, you know, take a look at that this week. Arun? Right. Um, thanks, Tracy. So quickly wanted to bring out the point that are not bring out, brought out in our call in Security Task Force last Friday. It's, it's mainly regarding the agenda for, for the task force and putting it, putting, I mean, making sure that we are proceeding towards that agenda, right? Um, I know in with, specifically within security task force, we started with something in mind and then it went all over places and probably think tanks are not reminding that in last week's call. We will uh, focus purely on the first open question that came up and then further proposing uh, it to the TSC in the coming weeks, probably I'll put up a proposal on that. Um, but yeah, that was one of the topic that like we will diversify the efforts that we are putting in over there. And probably there might be a new uh, working group proposal out of that discussion. So just wanted to give a quick hits up on that. A new working group or a new task force? Um, given, given the way it's going on right now, it would be a new working group proposal. Do we still have working groups? Yes, we do. They're not very oh. active, but they but exist. Do we, do, we still, do we still accept working groups? I thought we decided working groups, new working groups were not going to be formed and existing working groups could stay, but new working groups are not going to be formed. I don't remember that decision. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and take a look at that. Oh. <laughs> you might be right. I'm sorry. You will have to do no, no. that one up. <laughs> that's okay. I, I can't remember if that's what we actually decided or if that was just part of the discussion. Because um, what, so what we did decide, right, is we we removed the time frame limit on working groups and turned them and the the um, the uh, 
the the expectation that they would deliver some some product like a documentation or something and instead we said for things that have a very specific deliverable there will be task forces but the working groups can remain for discussions and so i think you know the, the what Arun is talking about is basically we started from the this idea of, oh, you know, I, I brought up that OpenSSF uh, issued, uh, published uh, uh, mm -hmm. guidelines on how to deal with disclosure of vulnerability disclosures. And I said, we should look into what it means for us. And the discussion as Arun was talking about is, you know, kind of leaned into all sorts of like security related issues, you know, into blockchain technology. And so we thought, okay, this is a broader topic that you know probably deserves a working group. But so it's it's, it's more discussion based than that yeah. is what we're thinking about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I remember at some point we had talked about like technical uh, interest groups, right? Replacing the working groups. I know we didn't go there, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, let us know where it goes and I will also see if I can uh, round up the discussion that we had about working groups in general so that I can at least respond back to my own question. Yeah, I mean, we, we could possibly create a different task force, but I think the problem is that, you know, the timeline is quite extensive here. We don't really know how long it would take to cover the topic. So that's why I okay. thought working group was more suitable, but. All right, sounds good. Anything else that anybody wants to bring up? No, okay. Um, so yeah, last time we talked about the Project Families website revamp, uh, we had a couple action items. Um, one that Jim took uh, for us, which was this functional grouping proposal um, that he's come back with uh, and just wanted to discuss it here with the, the task force um, focused, right? So people who might not have had a chance to look at this or respond to this, um, these were the kind of tags that were specified on the website and uh, these were the suggested tags. Arnold? Well, I, I wanted to start to commenting, so I don't know if you're done with the intro. No, no, I, I think, I think yeah i'm looking for feedback uh and thoughts on the proposal and if there's anything that we should add so i think we are ready for comments so know. okay so first i noticed there is two lines deployment automation one with bevel the other with cello i think those should be merged no mm, yes yes good point and then the other question i had was with the 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 firefly being listed along cactus in interoperability surprised me because i remember i haven't looked in firefly i'll admit i don't know how it has evolved but i remember you know quite specifically i had asked about that aspect when uh, the firefly proposal came up and uh, my understanding was that firefly it provides more like a portability feature which is that you can write your application independent of the blockchain framework being used underneath. But essentially, when you run an instance of Firefly, you choose which underlying technology you use, and you can't quite change as dynamically or connect. It doesn't allow you to connect different types of networks together, which is what Cactus does. So, I mean, Jim is here, maybe he'll, you know, he'll set me straight. I don't know. I, it, I was very surprised by that, so. Yeah, and I, I remember Jim, you and um, Angela yeah, had a discussion on Angela. this, right? Yeah, Angela, that, who brought it up earlier. Uh, maybe I can clarify a little bit. Uh, I think it's, um, it'd be great if, if Peter can comment on this as well. One of the options to do interop is in fact uh, just through a centralized component that coordinates events and transactions across the chains, listening to events for request on one chain and then submit a um, uh, transaction uh, from another and vice versa. Uh, and that's exactly what Firefly does, uh, which is a component that you deploy and then control 
that can be connected to multiple um, uh, multiple underlying blockchains. Um, we we have uh, most of the demos you see. It's only talking to one blockchain, but under the cover, it can do multiple blockchains. So more and more, uh, Farfly can, will be used uh, in that mode. So it naturally becomes sort of a uh, a centralized way to do interop. Um, and there, there are decentralized way and trustless components uh, to do interop, uh, but going through a centralized component to coordinate uh, across different chains, that's uh, a pretty legitimate uh, way to do interop, um, uh, unless that's not what um, other people think interop is. So would love yeah, to hear so what Peter's um, the, the, I think you just touched on the right question is, you know, what do we want the word interrupt to be used for, right? I mean, what you're describing to me is not really interoperability, but maybe I'm wrong. And, you know, I, the, this doesn't fit my expectation. I mean, because what you're talking about, this kind of centralized interoperability, I mean, any application can do that. Yes. Except uh, when you do that, you have to write a whole bunch of stuff that talks to those different chains and Farfly because Farfly makes that really easy. Uh, it, it makes it a pretty, um, a pretty good choice to do that kind of thing. Okay, I, I think this is overloading the term in a way that, you know, kind of doesn't yeah, set straight um, with me, but I yeah. understand your point of view. Honestly, the, the, the main um, the main message around Firefly is connectivity, uh, but it happens to fulfill a interop requirement. But if we think that confuse, uh, confuse people, um, honestly, I, I, I'm not, but it seems to be more than one um, the people that exp expressed concerns with this. Uh, we'd love to hear other people's um, yeah. thought around this. Yeah, Peter. Maybe we could add another category called integration, which it would be to me, at least that word implies more of the basic mechanical feature that was just described. And then interoperability would mean, uh, you know, the broader scope and uh, what uh, Arno would expect it to be. And then that way, people will still understand that uh, it's adjacent, but then there's different levels. It's like a scale. So interoperability would mean, you know, all the things that we're expecting is from cross chain atomic transactions being the, the pinnacle of it, uh, as my personal opinion. And then integration would just mean things like data sharing through events, event subscriptions, or, uh, data copying, things there. It's uh, fairly mechanical and, you know, as Arno said, well, it's pretty easy for any application to do this, but still there are tools out there that will make it much easier and they deserve a category that we could call integration. Just an idea. Yeah, that I makes, like the term. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Maybe we could call it connectivity slash integration gateway and lump those together there. Mm -hmm. Jim. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe a follow up. Um, uh, do we want to clarify cross chain interop as um, being focused on trustless models only? Um, to me, interop covers all of them. Uh, if you look at um, uh, technologies in the in, in the open. POA bridge, for example, POA network, the bridge they're using, uh, which is a pretty popular uh, token bridges, right? That 
um, hooks up Ethereum with, with, other, with other chains. The component they use is exactly the kind that Firefly has, and it's an interop component, um, but it's a trusted uh, implementation. Does the Cactus community want to focus on trustless only implementations, which I know, you know, the, the, the current Cactus code base with YUI, Weaver, all tend to focus on. And I think that'll clarify a lot of things. You know, just, just focus on on-chain verification of states in another chain and don't rely on any trusted centralized component anywhere. This will just, this will clarify things and not cause these kind of confusions. Would that work? Well, for Cactus, I would say the answer is that we want it all. So not just trustless, but also trusted. And then different levels of trust, you know, all the, the full spectrum of it with as much flexibility as possible. Uh, so that's why I was thinking that the interrupt category could be a superset of the integration, but uh, I'm also open to somehow refactoring that, but it's not. So if we say that Cactus only does trustless, that will not be true because they're aiming for a wider scope. Would it make sense to have another role then? Uh, no, Maybe, okay, yeah. never mind. <laughs> I was gonna propose cross-chain trusted interop and then have Firefly fitting there, but I don't know if that improves things. Uh, maybe, I, it could. I mean, the only thing I guess we want to try and avoid is having and very large number of categories because then it loses its value. But maybe this is just that one exception where we could just go for it. So I'm, I'm personally not against that. I don't know about the rest of the team here. I mean, we do have three different, well, I'm sorry, two different DLTs, right, um, tags. If you will, so, so. maybe let's try this, Tracy. Add mm -hmm. another uh, role behind uh, below this uh, cross chain trusted interop, and then put Firefly in there. Or cross chain interop. Uh, yeah. So this this document is available for concurrent editing. So if anyone would like to help Tracy with edits, you could just <laughs> jump in. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the TSC meeting minutes. I'm just making the edits directly there um, for anybody who's interested. So if we do this, do we need to add the word trustless to this one then, Jim? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that and then remove Firefly from that role. Does that work for the folks who had concerns? In my opinion, cross-chain trusted interop and integration gateway mean about the same thing. So that seems like one row to me. I don't want to be difficult, but. So this row and this row, then would you put Cactus in this row? And Angela? Yeah. May I? Yes, please, yeah. Angela. Yeah, to, to me, this is even worse, personal. From a research, I, I say this from a research <laughs> point of view, it, this is even worse. Uh, it's even more confusing uh, to, on, on a subject that is very delicate. It's not just, uh, even in the trusted setting, uh, how, how would you allow uh, um, rollbacks? Uh, where are the keys? So I, I, would, I would go very delicate with this uh, uh, in uh, input. It's, it's like saying, uh, that we can put fabric under verifiable credential, uh, credentials, the centralized ID, just because fabric has uh, uh, identity mixer support. 
So we also have uh, technically we have also fabric supports verifiable credentials, uh, but that would be misleading. Th that's my personal opinion. From a research point of view, this is nonsense. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can see your point with fabric could go into the verifiable data registry DLT, right? Um, there's actually people who are trying to make that reality um, by creating the correct smart contracts and interfaces to make that happen um, through ARIES, right? Uh, so uh, definitely, uh, I, I think we it is potentially a step too far. Nathan? Well, my first comment is if if someone's deployed fabric as a verifiable data registry, I think it's healthy for them to claim the tag because um, it shows what's actually going on in the community and helps people understand what's possible. Um, but the second is we need to come back and ask ourselves, what's the audience for these tags, especially when yeah, we have a lot of yeah. where there's only one project underneath each tag. Um, what is it we're trying to communicate with new newcomers to the ecosystem, right? Because it, it it's okay that you know us as TSC or maintainers would agree. Yeah, that tag seems seems truthful. It's not helpful if it doesn't say something to a newcomer that lets them know where they should start or what they should read or what they should do next. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Nathan, to think about who our audience is for these tags. Um, and the reason that we're creating these tags in the first place. Jim? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm the, the, the only goal I'm trying to achieve with this, the, the, the easiest would be just to remove Firefly from anything related to interrupt and be done with it because it's not designed for that. What I'm trying to enable is where enterprise permission chain is today. Um, I can see majority of the people who need quote unquote interop picking up Firefly, use it uh, and be done with it rather than trying to do the more sophisticated uh, cactus model, which is designed more for um, uh, untrusting parties trying to do interop. Um, I think where the enterprise uh, decentralized landscape is today, a trusted model would be sufficiently uh, uh, useful and, and likely to be adopted first before they go the full untrustless uh, way. That's where, I, that's where my head is and not getting them to realize Firefly can help like take care of 60% or even more uh, of that task would be a shame. Uh, on, on the other hand, I, I, I realize looking at this right now, it's, it's more confusing than before. So I don't know what's, what's the best way. Maybe we can start with not having Firefly at all. And then I um, think what's, what's possible later. But, but I think my, my point still stands. Okay, Peter. I was just going to say that I can see everybody's points. I kind of agree with all of them in a way. So it's just a really hard question because the underlying complexity of the software pieces that you're talking about is much higher than what you can easily express in a short little table like this. So there, it is bound to happen that there will be sort of uh, friction points where people disagree just because uh, it has to be simplified down somehow. And then some information will be lost. Uh, yeah, so I'm not very opinionated on this. And I also feel like because I'm a maintainer of cactus, maybe I'm a little biased. So yeah, I'm totally flexible. That's it. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Angela? Yeah, I, I'm asking, at, this, at this point, I'm a bit concerned. If it's true what Jim said, that many are using Firefly to um, 
to achieve interoperability, I'm wondering uh, under which assumption they are doing this. It, are they exposing themselves to risks that they don't understand something like this? So I would suggest the following. If Firefly believes to be a tool for interoperability, write down a page or even a paper to a conference and where, where this model is described in detail so, so people can better understand what they, what they expose themselves to when they use this model that uh, allegedly Firefly uh, allows to, to, to use. Then I will be, it's much more, we are doing a job for our, uh, we're doing a service for our community. Not just say, it can, people are using it for that purpose. Uh, good luck. I hope they are using it for, uh, in, the, in the right way. All right, thanks. So Peter, you still have your hand up? Is it just uh, hasn't gone now? Thanks. Um, <laughs> no worries. Uh, OK, so we have like seven minutes left before the top of the hour. Um, I think this is a good discussion. And um, I think the remaining question is, are there other sort of tags that people would see that we should add to this that aren't here? I don't see any hands. Um, if you do come up with something, uh, definitely, you know, put it. So I guess I have one more, one more question. Sorry. No, no. I mean, I, I think I forget who, but somebody uh, talked about, you know, what is the end goal? And um, should we, I mean, should a goal be to only have one category for each project? I mean, uh, right now, I think we have we have a pretty good list. I like the categories. There is one thing, it's indie, which is in two rows. Is that something that's really necessary or should we try to say, no, let's just have one? Uh, I don't think it matters okay. actually how many. Um... And that's why I said, I don't know what the goal is. Maybe it's yeah, like, no, I, we don't care. <laughs> I, I think the goal was to be able to have the tags on like this web page. Um, let's see if I can, I probably can't open it here. Um, but you can see general purpose DLT. Uh, yeah. So in the case of Indy, it would have two of them, right? General, or not general purpose, but the verifiable Data registry DLT and the verifiable credentials decentralized identity tag associated with it. Now, if we think that you know another project should have a additional tag um, because that's what people are going to go to the website and look for, um, then then you know maybe we need to think about is there another tag that we should add to this this list? Okay. Yeah, so the reason I had it in both places is uh, verifiable data registry is kind of a term that was invented uh, along the discussions I had with the maintainers uh, of Aries and Indy. It's not a very uh, recognizable term as verifiable credentials or DID. Right. That's, that's the main reason I, I feel like Indy deserves those more recognizable uh, labels, that, that's why. But the, the registry term more accurately describes what it does. Okay, I mean, I'm not against it, let's be clear. I, I'm just like, when I looked at the list, this is the one kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say oddities because it, it sounds negative, which is not what I'm trying to convey. It's just like, you know, it's a unique case. Yes. I, I, any other project is only in one row, I think. I have. So. Okay. Um, well, I think it's okay. Um, I will have to, I guess, see how that ends up looking on the actual website when it goes out to see if it's too much, um, but I do think it's worthwhile calling out that it is that the it is a DLT, but it also has some additional functionality built on top of it. 
specifically for the decentralized identity use case. Um, so, you know, it's not a general purpose DLT, so it's going to be some other sort of DLT, and I think that's the, the name that it was given here. Um, so I know we're about ready to, to be finished with this conversation. Um, we didn't make it very far through what I wanted to discuss. There is a uh, new Confluence page that I created here, a website personas, which I think is this one um, that I would appreciate offline if people could add to this, things that they think that people visiting the Hyperledger website are visiting it for, um, so that we can at least have a general idea of the sorts of things that we would need to do uh, when it comes to the, the website itself. And then the other piece uh, that we didn't have time to get to is this new proposed getting started page uh, that David and uh, the team has come up with for us to review and provide feedback on. Um, so maybe we can do that also in an offline fashion uh, since we won't be meeting again for another what month. Um, to talk through this. So I think it's worthwhile to, to do some work offline while we have the opportunity for those folks who are interested in participating in this task force. So uh, with that, I think I'm gonna close for today and uh, look forward to seeing some input and feedback on the website personas and on this new getting started page. Um, there is a chat channel for the project families uh, task force um, that exists in Discord. So please join us there for additional discussions and things that you want to add to um, to what you're seeing here coming out of the, the work that's being done offline. So with that, I'm going to close uh, the meeting and thank you all for joining and participating. Thank you. Tracy, thanks everyone. Thanks.